Thank you for three great papers. Um, so I'm going to, I have a few questions and comments for you guys, and then I want to open it um, right away to um, conversation and questions. Um, my first question is for Kimia and Remy to, together, because I think that there are um, really interesting overlaps between your, your papers. Both of them deal with um, the idea that art can deliver some kind of truth about the subject that it's, that it's representing. Um, Kimia, you talk about um, Richards being maybe not starting out as a skeptic, but, but in this work really sort of becoming a skeptic about um, the possibility for, for, for art to actually capture nature and kind of art articulating this, or at least disrupting that idea that it's, that it's, uh, that nature is perfectly represent representable, um, disrupting that by, and articulating it in the, in the surface, as you, as you demonstrated. Um, while in, in your paper you are um, talking about a, a work of art that represents the, um, the absolute belief in the mimetic potential of art, you know, so much so that the, that the object actually can stand as a, really stand as a substitute for the, for the subject represented. Um, so my question is, well, first of all, I, I'd be interested just to hear you guys and your, your, your thoughts on, um, sounds like my phone, on art and truth, <laughs> but also uh, more specifically about, um, how the possibility of truth for both of these artists is connected to um, the, the materiality or the physicality of the subject being represented, if that makes, if that makes sense. Um, sure, um, thank you for a great question. I wrote down to myself, is Richards a skeptic? Um, because <laughs> I've never thought about it quite in those terms and I, I'd <laughs> like to think more about that, whether that's whether that's a word that you know um, fits, or whether I need to rethink my argument in order to maybe, because I think um, one thing that I've been dealing with, and I'm not sure it's, sorry, if I'm going off mic <laughs> if I turn towards you, um, is the question of kind of is 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 truth you know um, in Richard's mind or in his work like a stable concept, or is it mm -hmm. something that um, I'm as I think I'm trying to show. Um, very much shifting in, in the period. And um, Richard's sort of evident worry about mm. that um, is, you know, he, he, I don't know if he is, he thinks that pictures can't achieve truth, mm. um, but rather he seems to be very concerned, like he seems to be very concerned about um, his, his ability to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that really- That definitely that comes, question, that, but, that, that for yeah. sure comes through and maybe skeptic is, is, a, is is overstating his. Well, but, the, but it does speak to a broader, I mean, this is kind of a, a broader um, imaginary that I'm thinking about, especially uh, water reveals this in a really particular way, at, um, as my research is kind of showing, is that um, there, there begins to coalesce this, this um, sort of concern about why represent something um, like the ocean, um, why does that become something valuable to represent um, at the same time that it is, um, you know, considered a kind of, as I said, a sort of limit case mm -hmm. for the impossibility of something like a painting or a drawing to actually represent it. You know, why, why even do that if it's sort of destined to be futile, as, as Richard says. And does, do you think that the difficulty in representing that has to do with the immateriality of water? Um, yeah, I think I think absolutely. Um, you know, I, I drew a lot on Ruskin for this particular paper, mm -hmm. but, um, and he, he really, um, really uh, usefully illustrates this point in his, in his discourse, which is all about what he calls the properties of water, the, you know, um, both the kind of affective properties, but very much the material properties. Um, and one thread that's, that I'm playing with, not so much in this talk, but in the broader project, has to do with not just water's kind of elusiveness or um, ability to frustrate vision, but also its capacity to generate new kinds of vision. That's something that Ruskin talks a mm. lot about. Um, water's capacity to function as a kind of mirror in some cases, or a kind of lens in other cases, even to function as a kind of sculptor to shift the shape of something like a coastline, um, uh, even to kind of inscribe a kind of pattern in the movement of waves, um, to refract or distort things seen through it, 
these are all um, you know concepts that Ruskin really emphasizes. So it's not quite as I'm trying to kind of work with that binary, like kind of get rid of that binary that water is just something that's hard to see, mm. as water itself becomes a kind of visual agent in a really interesting way in this period. And I think. Um, I think even position Richard's work is intersecting with that too. But it certainly destabilizes an idea of water simply as impossible, but rather a kind of new set of conditions that artists might be interested in addressing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for that question. Um, authenticity, verism, um, that's a central concern for my broader research in this period, um, especially because during the Civil War, there was sort of a mounting urgency on the part of um, audiences um, in demanding um, an explicit um, reality or authenticity in images of Civil War visual culture, Civil War material. So painters really struggled at this time to um, condense the war's um, really traumatic and momentous events into a sort of allegory or a history painting. And so at this point in time, um, history pointing really dissolves um, as a predominant genre um, in the United States. Um, and I think there's some pressure put on history painting by photography. Mm. Um, and I think there's some really interesting parallels between the indexicality of photography and the indexicality of a mold mm -hmm. um, or you know, the, from which you could take a cast. And mm -hmm. so I'm interested um, more broadly in Civil War visual culture, how authenticity is brought as this um, sort of prerequisite or metric um, for those images, and then how we can see that in Lincoln's own person as well, this, this interest in um, sort of confirming and grounding that um, authenticity of his own physical characteristics um, through sculpture at this point in time too. So those are some, sort of some of the tensions at play and questions I'm asking. Mm -hmm. And I thought that there were some, there were some interesting parallels um, between the, your talk and the talk that Megan Gave last night just this this belief that the that the that the work of art actually carries something of the of the subject, you know, and that's what I mean. One of the things that perhaps leads to the to the scratching. Um, so, Michael, um, you talk about um, about the about Irwin's kind of um, use of, of space. As, um, as as part of his, and I'm wondering if it's, a, it's a, if is it a is it a conscious um, um, kind of decision to on his part to try to not be seen as um, retreating to this kind of traditional modernism. Like, how conscious is he of how he's um, being, being written about at the time? Um, that's a good question. Uh, Irwin tends to be very uh, sort of controlling about the narrative of his work. I uh, know that he's familiar, for example, with some of the uh, critical reception from the late 1960s with regards to like his uh, disc paintings and the column that I showed, that kind of thing. Um, he claims, though, to sort of be not interested in what art historians have to say about his work. That's a common sort of refrain when he's asked. Um, so whether or not he's kind of, I doubt that he's sort of uh, aware of this kind of post-structuralist discourse that's emerged around his work and its, its idea of criticality and this use of negative space. He's been pretty, uh, he tends to sort of keep his blinders on in that sense. And, and I also wonder about, so, so you, you talk a lot about the space and the, the kind of the movement through space and the, the, relation the relation between the viewer and the, and the, the, the environment as, I, I think, if I'm understanding you correctly, as kind of evidence that he, um, that he was a minimalist in some ways. Um, I'm wondering if you can say more about how um, his kind of desire to move the, the viewer through space in that way um, contributes to the emotional experience that we kind of traditionally associate with, you know, that modernist kind of just standing and being, uh, you know, completely just optically absorbed. How does the, the body play into that? That's a great question. Um, I mean, certainly there's a kind of, it kind of, there's this kind of unfolding through time. That just, and that, I think, 
accentuates this kind of drama of the installation as the light comes through. So again, it's this kind of balancing where you have this movement through space that on the one hand is very kind of physical and a very kind of matter of fact experience of kind of going around through this installation and seeing all the different scrims and you know how they're attached to the ceiling and how they're attached to the floor and you know looking at the quality of the scrim fabric or the walls and the windows. There's this very kind of physical aspect to it, but at the same time it also kind of plays into this uh, growing sense of drama and grandeur that's unfolding in this space. And so in a way it's kind of working both ways. It's, it's not the kind of, uh, you know, it's not the kind of traditional like the Robert Morris kind of the L-beams on the floor sort of thing and this, this very kind of everyday matter of fact presentation, but there's also this kind of uh, sort of ecstatic experience of experiencing the desert and all that mm -hmm. that's at play as well in the mm -hmm. work. So again, it's, you know, that, 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 uh, interpretive line, I guess, sort of comes from Michael Fried, who felt that the, the movement through the space was in a way kind of destroying the sanctity of modernism in particular, but also of the art object. So um, kind of taking up that line of inquiry. On the one hand, yes, it's not this kind of thing that you can just sort of stand in front of and, and have kind of a rapturous experience, because you actually have to move through it. And then you have to go outside and look at the <laughs> sculpture. So there's a lot to see and a lot to do in it. But at the same time, there is this kind of growing sort of cumulative effect of the light and sort of the, the beauty of the desert and all of that that contributes again to this kind of, uh, again, a kind of what we, I'm calling kind of a late modernist experience that in some ways is close to what, you know, Freed enjoyed about modernism and mm -hmm. its kind of uh, transcendent possibilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Questions? Megan, we oh, okay. we're going to throw this microphone around. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much um, for three great talks. I have a question for Ramey about um, the Lincolniana um, d discussed more broadly. So like the casts, the, the uh, photographs, the, um, the actual body parts, like the, the piece of bone and um, than like his clothing, et cetera, that was preserved. What were period um, understandings of like the hierarchy of those, um, like uh, of those relics? Um, I mean, not all of them are relics, but yeah. of no, that's those. That's an excellent question. Yeah. And that's kind of what this, um, this research is trying to do is to try to um, nuance that hierarchy or this notion of um, sort of intellectual artifacts um, in the American imaginary. So mm -hmm. um, I benefited a lot from the research of Teresa Barnett, who um, is one of the only scholars in American um, history who I've found who's written um, about um, relics um, in American culture, and it's, her book is Sacred Remains. Um, and she talks primarily about these, again, primary relics. So combing um, battlefields um, after they've taken place, you know, for instance, at Gettysburg, just for any remnants um, of the uh, events that took place there. Um, so those are just more like sort of this base material, sort of raw material um, gathering. Um, and so I'm just trying to suggest that there are other um, gradations of that um, categorization that we can consider. And I think that, um, you know, these, these casts, what I didn't mention in the talk that's important to um, also consider is that um, St. Gaudens um, produced this controlled series of these casts uh, from the original molds that they then sold um, in order to raise money to donate the original plaster molds um, to the American Museum of Hist the Museum of American History um, in D.C. So, um, and these mold these casts, you know, whether they were bronze or plaster, um, they all contained um, actually an authentic written on um, the sort, sort of truncated ends of the wrists that said, you know, these casts come from the life mask, the original life mask um, and cast taken um, from Lincoln by Leonard Wells Volk. Um, so people were aware that there was this, um, this greater value and authenticity that um, sort of freighted these objects if you acknowledge that they came from the ones that were sort of closer proximity to Lincoln's own person. Um, so that was, um, so I think that people are aware and thinking through those, um, those levels a bit more carefully and um, capitalizing on them um, in their own collections in that way too. Um, yeah. Thank you. Martha, you have to get rid of this thing immediately. <laughs> uh, uh, mostly because it's probably the Embrace biggest germ the bank in this room, you know, so uh, <laughs> now I've really, now I've contaminated it. Um, 
uh, thank you all three. I wish I, I had a question for the the panel, but it was such beautiful hetero heterogeneous thinking that that I that I don't. So my question is for Kimia. I right? thank you so much for for this beautiful uh, paper, and I'm completely with you in in opening our eyes to this amazing watercolor and the and the uh, uh, analogies between technique and representation. I, that was beautifully done, and and the carpet paper was so surprising. There was a sort of a gasp in the audience. I I, I really loved all of that. On 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 the other hand, though, when we do this kind of looking and forensic digging into an object like you're doing, I'm sometimes worried that the that the flip side of all of it falls a little bit out of view, right? And the flip side of it is that here is carpet paper used, right? And by that, the you know the the sort of substance that props up the bourgeois carpet and the bourgeois home on whose walls this watercolor is ending up, who, uh, which with all its ideologies of shoring up the American home, uh, and then you start looking at this watercolor in such different ways, right? Not as an image of water and rocks, but as an image of a border zone uh, that seems quite walled, right? And hostile and comes with all these ideologies of uh, of America um, and and and, uh, uh, and and has nothing to do with the kind of porous border that is the coastline with all its commerce and its endless immigration and emigration that this image just refuses to see so I'm I'm wondering I know why one wants to get away from all of that right because that is sort of the traditional interpretation of, of American landscape picture making, but I'm wondering what happens if we don't see it at all anymore, right? So, um, and, and if some conversation between that form of interpretation and yours can be had, or whether there's no connection points at all. Thank you, I'm so glad you asked that question. And did you use shore up as a pun? Because I personally <laughs> really, really loved that. I time. didn't, but. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so um, short answer, yes, um, but I'll elaborate. Um, I think it's absolutely, and this is something I've really been struggling with, is how to balance this kind of close looking that I'm really, um, and a sort of interrogation of process that I'm trying to do with exactly what's not in these pictures, because um, Richard's pictures, as you say, of, of, um, of the coastline and the ocean are by and large devoid of human occupation. Um, but of course, he's absolutely embedded in um, the uh, really fascinating economic history of the Gilded Age. And furthermore, he's an artist who moves quite a lot across the Atlantic. Um, and you know, he's showing in the Royal Academy. He's shipping works across the ocean. Um, he's writing letters from Newport inland to patrons. There's, there's this whole kind of economy that his work absolutely participates in. So how to engage those histories without just simply um, pointing out what's, what's not there has been a question. Um, there's a really um, wonderful book by um, Matthew Johnson. Um, uh, it came out in 2016. It's about sort of print culture in the 19th century um, in, in America. And there's a chapter about um, pictures of the shoreline by, by Richards and also John Frederick Kensett and thinking about how um, the kind of absence of people um, elides the economic present, specifically the touristic present of these mm -hmm. places particularly Newport, which of course by the Gilded Age was um, not only a, a popular resort, but home to some of the most wild and uh, opulent mansions um, that the kind of industrial um, elite were building and all the inherent kind of labor and class structures along, along with them. And I might add that Richards himself built a quite grandiose <laughs> home on Connecticut Island in Newport. Unfortunately, it doesn't exist anymore, but I, plan to go to the Historical Society and hopefully look at the interior um, for precisely kind of what you, what you mentioned, mm -hmm. thinking about what actually furnishes the walls and floors of this place. Um, but one way that I'm trying to, so I'm trying to um, very much in the chapter not ignore this history, but one thing that's really become a particularly interesting way to engage with it um, is to not so much think just in terms of you know, cataloging what's not in the pictures, um, but how to engage their context kind of I suppose on a more structural level. Um, and I've been reading a lot about discourse surrounding you know, the experience of being in these coastal towns um, as places of speculation, places of, of incredible financial investment, um, and a lot of kind of anxiety surrounding the performance of class and the stability, in fact, of, so, of surface appearances in the social context. Um, and so I'm trying to sort of think about Richard's 
worry about the status and stability of truth in his pictures, um, not just simply as, as a kind of, I, I really would like to not make an argument that says, that sort of legitimizes him. He found a better way to access nature. Isn't that, isn't that you know, pure and great? Um, but thinking about his concern with truth actually is absolutely part of what's happening all around him. Um, so in that sense, it very much is in the picture. So thank you. I have a question for Ramey, um, and I really like what you, oh, my sister. Yeah. <laughs> this is so weird. Um, I really like what you did with um, bringing a, a kind of perspective in relation to relics and to the holy face. Um, but I, I wondered whether the, the kind of fortuitousness of a life cast having been made shortly before Lincoln's death and then being used to commemorate Lincoln afterwards, whether that's doing any kind of labor for commemoration of dead people in the wake of the Civil War and the the kind of problem of civil, the body and the photography's engagement with death and dead bodies and mutilation. And so whether there's a relationship between them that you're considering. Yes, absolutely. Um, so there's been a lot of work done um, on considering Lincoln um, and his own early death as sort of a parallel between, you know, just the massive amount of um, uh, loss of life that the Civil War witnessed. So a lot of people sort of channeled, it was like the whole nation could kind of engage in this mourning and grief process that was not only um, focused on Lincoln, but also their own losses. So a lot of, the, there's been a, an absolute connection drawn there. Um, and yeah, just um, the first part of your question about the mold, right, or like the, the proximity of that to, um, I think that it's just so interesting that the, that the cast was taken right at his ascendancy, right before he became president. It was just so much life packed into that, um, that particular mold um, that I think um, brings, it just adds so much nuance to those, um, those later, the subsequent statuary when you think about the fact that they were referencing that life mask. It's not a death mask that they're referencing. Um, and in fact, another life mask was taken of Lincoln very shortly before his assassination, so after um, the entirety of the Civil War, and it looks like a death mask. I mean, you see it, and it's, it's a profoundly different face and a profoundly different man. So um, at some point, you know, bringing those into conversation would be really illustrative of that point as well, and I would like to do that too, so thank you. So I have, a, I have a question that I think might be for all of you, but it was inspired by what, along with Martha, I saw as some of the overlap or cross-pollination be between the first two talks. And, and I wanna ask about topography, and this is why I think it has to do with what um, Michael presented, because it struck me that, that both of you, well, well, Ramey and Camille, bo both of you w were describing a new or, or, or reconfigured re relationship between figure and ground, meaning you have this carpet paper and then you make a representation, but that representation brings with it something from the world um, in the same way that the plaster brings with it something from the world, the hair from Lincoln's scalp, but the ground is as with the carpet paper, itself a kind of topography. It's a topography of flesh. The carpet paper is a sort of topo topography of materiality. Um, and I'm wondering, I'm wondering if you're, you're seeing what you're doing as producing, I mean, this might be a rhetorical question because I would answer yes. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I wonder if you see what you're doing as, as a, attempting to reimagine what the relationship between something like mimesis and materiality might be, not just in the, Amer the American context, but in terms of picturing projects more generally in the 19th century. And the reason I think this might be related to Michael's talk is because I was really struck by how you, I think, rightly resisted the idea 
or resisted collapsing this into the category of site specificity. I think that the, the Irwin project, I think that was really smart. And so I'm curious to hear what your sense of figure and ground is and, and how, if this isn't site specificity, how it might be a reconfiguration of the notion of, of how materials relate to the ground that they come into contact with. So maybe that at base is my question. You know, what are, what are you three imagining happens when materials come into contact with a kind of ground that isn't necessarily the canvas surface? Because none of you were talking about that, really. I'll go first. OK. Um, so my, my positioning of it, not as site specific, as I said, comes from Irwin's own uh, language that he likes to use. He uses the term site conditioned. He, he tends to use Richard Serra as, as his example of somebody who he would consider site specific, where the work is kind of created in, with regards to the site, but ultimately he says it's kind of like plopped down on the site, which uh, he distinguishes from his own site conditioned practice, which he feels really responds in every way to sort of the conditions of the site. And so it's not, it's not an object that's kind of brought in and placed, but it's an object that's uh, more in tune, I guess, with its environment. The Marfa installation, though, is an unusual one uh, for him, and because it's the first time that he ever actually like created a, a structure from the ground up that was actually kind of leveled and placed on the site. So it's an interesting kind of transition for him in his own body of work because it departs, I think, a little bit from this idea that the uh, that the work should only sort of be integrated into the site. Usually they're displayed either in galleries or in some kind of public space where they kind of uh, intercede in the environment. Um, but certainly uh, it's, a, it's a, um, a new relationship for him in terms of reconceiving that site-specific thing. And uh, I think that, um, you know, again, it's this kind of uh, balance between interjecting into the site versus kind of creating something that's meant to sort of integrate with it or somehow just become part of the landscape. So yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, I love this question or this idea of um, a facial topography as functioning as a, a kind of ground um, and a ground that kind of becomes a substrate um, or um, precedent for so much, um, you know, other statuary um, from its uh, fracture. Um, and just your, um, the analogy between material and mimesis is also really helpful. Um, another chapter in this paper considered bronze, um, very specifically what it lends to a lifelikeness quality and the sort of aqueous um, uh, nature to its actual um, material. So I was looking at um, Itai Weinrib's, um, um, his notion of iconology of technique with bronze and um, just that bronze is um, such a special material for portraits. Um, and considered to be to lend itself particularly well to portraiture. Um, so, yes, to all of the above, I think that's a wonderful connection um, between the three of us. Yeah. yeah, thank you for elucidating that. It made me see um, all of our papers um, in a really in a really different um, light. And I think I'm also yeah really invested in in finding and engaging with um, these different artworks and artistic techniques and operations um, how they reconstitute. Um, a relationship or perhaps propose um, tensions we haven't considered between ideas of mimesis and materiality mm -hmm. as period specific um, and contested uh, terms and, and indeed rhetorics. Um, one thing, one sort of aspect of figure ground I'm thinking about in Richard's work is indeed his rhetoric to do with his own process, which I rely on really heavily in this talk, but actually he was sort of known for talking all about his kind of physical precarity and physical danger in relation to the ocean. And there's all this writing about him going into the water physically, like his own body immersing in both the kind of ground, but also his subject. Um, and trying to understand that as a way of kind of unpacking um, productively ideas about truth and nature as rhetorical ideas, um, maybe constituted in and through these, these tensions um, as well. So. One more question. Yeah. Um, my question is already, um, I think it's both on Megan's question. Um, I'm interested in the relationship between uh, the American relic and histories of collective violence in the nation building project, and uh, interested in which collective deaths are made visible and whether there are collective deaths that are not made visible by the relic. And 
My question is partly informed by a senior thesis I co-advised with Robert Maxwell about a decade ago. Uh, Roland Betancourt did a senior thesis at Penn on uh, the objects coming out of the World Trade Center as relics, which made me think again about you know, this kind of echo of a nation building project that uses individual objects to recognize certain deaths, but maybe also to occlude other kinds of violences. And um, I guess I'm interested in knowing how a comparative thinking across the medieval and the modern informs or occludes that way of thinking. that I'm mean, thinking about um, other moments um, of tragedy um, in the United States and what kind of material refuse we sort of amass to commemorate um, those events and, and um, the meeting that we If you have a ticket on your phone, you'll show it upstairs for you. It's extremely important and oh, yeah. it's that the material, I mean, you know, what is left to us, what remains, obviously not, you know, some things don't remain or some things aren't deemed um, granted that importance um, and aren't sort of sequestered in, um, you know, an American history museum. So um, I think being sensitive to that that distinction um, is is of critical importance. Um, and you know, this is not necessarily um, my dissertation project, but I think thinking about um, this sort of relictual tradition writ large is is a really important one. Um, and especially um, its potency in the 19th century and how it sort of carries on, it absolutely does carry on through the 20th and the 21st. So um, just, being, just being really aware of that and careful with that. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everybody. We're, we're